I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life at Columbia University. Thank you for joining us for Awakening Our Democracy, Voters, Access, and the 2020 Elections. This is an extraordinary election year, to put it mildly. Rarely have we faced so many critical issues at one time. A deadly pandemic, spiraling economic challenges, deep unrest over racial injustice and anti-Black racism, and political turmoil in nearly every corner of our country. Yet many eligible voters choose not to participate. Others face significant barriers to voting, and countless Americans now question the validity of the voting process. So we have a lot to talk about, and we are fortunate to have wonderful experts to share their insights and help us all think about these critically important issues. Uh, so first, a word about university life, and then we'll turn to the discussion. Our focus in Columbia's Office of University Life is on our university as a community, bringing us together for conversations about pressing issues, just like the one we're about to have today. We are also a hub for university-wide student life, information, resources, initiatives, events that support inclusion and belonging, mental health and well-being, sexual respect and community citizenship, including many opportunities for students and others around the university to get to know each other, to connect, and really to engage deeply on significant issues of our time. I encourage you to spend time on University Life's website. You might especially take a look at our web pages on inclusion and belonging and at CU Engage, civic engagement at Columbia University. You can also stay fully up to date on events like this by following Columbia University Life on social media. Turning now to our program for today, I want to thank everyone who submitted questions in advance. If you have questions during the event, and I'm sure you will, uh, if you're watching on Zoom, please put them into the Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you're watching on the live stream, please send them to us by email at universitylife at columbia.edu. And now I'm, this event is being recorded and you will be able to find it on University Life's website starting tomorrow. I'm happy to introduce now our wonderful panelists. We have Robert Shapiro, the Wallace S. Sayre Professor of Government and Professor of International and Public Affairs in the Department of Political Science and in the School of International and Public Affairs here at Columbia. He's the former chair of the Political Science Department and the former acting director of Columbia's Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy. The co-author of several books, including Selling Fear, Counterterrorism, the Media and Public Opinion, Professor Shapiro's research and teaching interests cover partisan, pol partisan polarization and ideological politics in the US, along with public opinion and policymaking, politi political leadership, mass media, and statistical methods. Rena Shaw is with us as a political commentator. She was a 2016 delegate to the Republican National Convention, former spokesperson for Next Gen GOP. She has served as a senior aide to two Republican members of Congress. Rena is a regular on-air contributor for PBS, MSNBC, Fox, and many other outlets. She is the founder of Relax Strategies, which specializes in government affairs, political consulting, and strategic communications. Midwin Charles is the founder of the New York law firm, Midwin Charles & Associates. She is also a well-known commentator on politics, law, and pop culture for CNN, HLN, MSNBC, and other media. Ms. Charles has also worked for CNN as a legal contributor and is a radio host and contributor to Essence Magazine. Tricia Shimomura is the Director of Government Relations in the Office of Government and Community Affairs at Columbia University. Uh, here she supports Columbia's engagement with federal, state, and local governments. She previously worked as Deputy Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Tricia is also the founder of She Will Rise, an organization focused on building a pipeline of women to become the next generation of leaders in the public and private sectors. Our moderator, who we're also glad to have back with us, is Jamie Floyd, an attorney, an award-winning journalist, and the legal editor in the WNYC newsroom, and the senior editor at WN for New York Public Radio, the senior editor for Race and Justice at New York Public Radio. In a journalism career that spans two decades, Jamie has worked on everything from breaking news and exclusives to long form investigation. And she has interviewed many of the elected officials who will be familiar to you 
including, of course, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Jamie, I will turn it over to you to take us through the discussion. I'll just say maybe one quick tech point, which is that if you have any difficulty during, and you're watching on Zoom, just log off and log back in or go to U Columbia University Life's website and where you can find this live streaming. And the discussion will start off for about 35, 40 minutes among our panelists. And then uh, Jamie will, will take questions from the audience. So Jamie, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne, for that wonderful introduction and for having me back. I always find uh, these Awakening Our Democracy panels to be a highlight of my year. So I'm so pleased to be back and I'm pleased that you're able to convene these conversations uh, in the remote setting and perhaps uh, even to welcome a, a broader audience since we are remote and we, we can join one another virtually. Um, let's start the conversation with what some would say is our most fundamental right, uh, especially in this election season, and that is what we're here to talk about, our right to vote. Um, our founders demanded representation uh, in the Declaration of Independence, and when they didn't get it, the revolution began, and along the way, African Americans, women, and even young people have demanded the right to vote. Medgar Evers died for it. John Lewis very nearly did. Uh, but the Brookings Institute recently found that 100 million people did not vote in the last presidential election. Uh, that's the year 2016. Some people might say that's not very many people, uh, but <laughs> others would say that's a lot of people not exercising this fundamental right. So let's begin with the question why vote? Does the vote really matter? Does your vote really count? Let's start with you, Bob Shapiro, as a political matter. Why should people still believe in the power of their vote? Well, first of all, I want to I want to thank th thank you all for inviting me to um, to speak here to join this very esteemed panel. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to reiter re reiterate the normative point that Jamie Floyd made: people fought and died for the vote. And I think that's perhaps the most significant and persuasive argument. From a cold-hearted political science or economic rationality point of view, I would, I would argue there are good reasons to vote. Now, the, the, the explanation of why, why people don't vote is very easy. Norm, nor, normally, the way economists approach this is that the costs of voting are usually exceed the benefits. And the benefits are a function of um, the benefits of the outcome of the election multiplied times the probability that one person's vote will make a difference. Now, I would argue in the current political context, and we can debate about this in the past, the, the benefits here and the co are really extraordinary. And the, the, the benefits have to do with, one, in this current highly polarized time, the stake of maintaining a, uh, a democracy. That's really an issue here. The United States needs a free and fair election uh, to show itself that it's a, a functioning democracy and to show the world we're a functioning democracy. So that, that benefit is huge. And I would, I would argue it, it approaches infinity. It's that big. The other, the other benefit, the other stake here has to do with the fact because of partisan conflict and polarization today and the competitiveness of the parties, it's possible now for an election to produce a unified Republican or Democratic government, which means that policy can shift dramatically if Republicans control the presidency and Congress and thereby the judiciary or the Democrats do the same. We've seen this when Barack Obama was elected, uh, given the fact that with his unified government control, he was able to pass uh, Obamacare which was one of the most significant social welfare policies in, in, in recent years. And then when Trump was elected, in terms of the stakes of his, his followers, he was elected and was able to enact tax reform, deregulation, court appointments. As Trump himself says, elections have consequences and may be the only you know, correct thing he said in, 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 his, in, his, in his years in office. And that stake in particular, I would, I would give a value of infinite. Multiply infinity, even by the small likelihood that a, a single vote can make can make a difference. That's still an enormous benefit that I, I would argue outweighs the cost, and particularly for new generations in American politics for, for, for whom these stakes matter a lot, given uh, the many years that they, that they have ahead. And so the message here is universal, and especially for the new generation of voters in the United States. So there's the universal message. Now let's talk a bit about uh, different uh, sectors of the voting population. Midwin Charles, I'm going to come over to you. 
Uh, Bob talked about, as did I, people who fought and died for the right to vote. And of course, our people, uh, perhaps first among those African Americans uh, who, uh, of course, did not have the right to vote, not even full people uh, in the original founding documents. But then we were guaranteed that right in the Reconstruction uh, Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. But not really until the Civil Rights Act of 1965 did we truly uh, obtain and receive the full guarantee, the full force of those amendments, the right to vote. Uh, and I want to ask you about Black women, uh, Midwin. Uh, women like Sojourner Truth during suffrage and Fannie Lou Hamer, one of my heroes during the Civil Rights Movement. Black women are reliable voters, are they not? Uh, are, are their votes taken for granted? Uh, the Pew Research uh, Center recently found that Black voter turnout uh, in 2016 declined for the first time, uh, falling for the first time in 20 years, falling to 59.6% after, of course, record high voter turnout among African Americans in the Obama years, and also among Black women, it fell. Uh, perhaps understandable, again, without Barack Obama on the ticket, uh, but are Black women feeling uh, taken uh, for granted, and uh, why should Black women vote uh, and still feel the passion for the vote that we felt in the 1960s and 50s when we were marching uh, and demonstrating and protesting for the right to cast that vote? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Suzanne, uh, Columbia University, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, Jamie, to answer your question, um, Black women, uh, for all intents and purposes, are the backbone of the Democratic Party with respect to how much we come out to vote and how consistently we vote Democratic. So in other words, we don't go back and forth between Republican, Independent, and Democrat. We tend to be very consistent in the way in which we vote. And you made a very good point in acknowledging that in the 2016 election, that Black voter turnout was significantly less. And there are a variety of reasons for that. One, we didn't have the first Black person uh, on the ballot, that's one. But two, the 2016 presidential election was the first election after the Supreme Court decision, the Shelby County decision uh, in 2013. And what that decision did is, you mentioned the Civil Rights Act, but there's also uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which ensured that there would be no discrimination against Black people when they went to go vote. What the Shelby decision did in the Supreme Court is strike a provision from the Voting Rights Act that required pre-clearance of states that had previously discriminated against Black people in voting. So most mostly states in the South, Texas, Georgia, and so on. So part, what a lot of people don't realize is what's amazing about how we pass laws in America is there are many different parts to the law. We tend to say that, for example, the Voting Rights Act just prohibited discrimination, but it was also very specific in that it had different sections on what rules had to be followed to, to preserve uh, and prevent discrimination. And one of those rules was what I just mentioned is pre clearance. As soon as that Supreme Court decision came out, within months, many, many Republican controlled states started to pass laws that made it difficult for people to vote disproportionately African American, young people, elderly people and disabled. So when we talk about black voter turnout in 2016 being lower when compared to 2012 and 2008, we can't say that without also acknowledging the fact that the Shelby decision had been in play at that point. But why should black people vote? Why should black women vote? Why should everyone vote? Because decisions are being made about you, whether you participate or not in our politics. I'm sure, um, unless you've had your head in the sand for the past few days, we are right now going through a confirmation process of a Supreme Court justice. And if you've had the opportunity to tune in for just a few minutes, you would see the great length at which uh, civil rights for LGBTQIA are discussed, Roe versus Wade, uh, uh, which is a seminal decision uh, that said that women should be able to protect uh, or make decisions for themselves for their body, uh, abortion rights. Uh, there are just so many things that they're talking about and they have to do about you. They have to do ab about us. So if you don't vote, you don't play a role 
in these discussions. You don't send your elected officials into that room to have that discussion. You'll notice there were many senators from all across the country making some very good points, some very bad points, but we can talk about that another time. But you want to get your person in the room. You want to get your person at the table. And the way to do that is to vote. And Midwin, I uh, always mention the Civil Rights Act because it was passed in the year of my birth. So I, uh, I am very uh, fond of mentioning it, but you are absolutely right about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I wanna come back to Shelby versus Holder and, and the significance of that decision and other structural impediments to voting in just a moment. Uh, with you and our panel. But let me turn to Rena Shaw with this question about voting. And Rena, you and I talked about this very question earlier in the week. So I'm we did. <laughs> We're all about voting this week. I'm going to ask you a slightly different uh, version of it this time around. Same theme, though. Uh, and take the vote right back to the founders. Uh, since the revolution was about lack of representation for the colonies. But John Adams wrote, quote, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and in opposition to each other. Mm -hmm. This in my humble apprehension is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our constitution, end quote. Pretty prescient, right? And so Rena, the Brookings study that I mentioned at the beginning actually found that one reason people don't vote is because they feel that the Republicans and the Democrats are doing such a poor job of representing them and honoring our democracy. Do you think we need a third party or maybe more to get out the vote, to get people renewed and engaged again in the democratic process? You know, Jamie, it's funny you asked that question because in 2016, I actually worked with the independent presidential candidate, Evan McMullen, and we traveled across the country in what I would call a sprint to the finish. He launched his campaign in August of 2016, and many people still do not know who he is to this day because our campaign was so unusual in that way. He launched it, and Evan himself was, again, a presidential candidate who left his job on Capitol Hill working for Republicans to launch an independent presidential bid with the hope of denying Donald Trump the electoral votes needed. Um, and that was what we aimed for. We tried for it and we failed miserably, but we tried. And I learned a lot in that three months. What I really learned is that there's not a great appetite for independent politics in the country. Every four years we talk about it third party, what's it really mean? And this year, a lot of the audience may have heard messaging from different sources saying, when you go to the polls this year, if you are against the current occupant of the the Oval Office, and that is Donald J. Trump, you cannot vote third party. You cannot write someone in because that is a vote for Trump. And so people may be hearing that right now. But back to my experience in 2016, when I briefly left the Republican Party to help uh, Evan McMullen's bid, in traveling out West, and, and eventually our campaign strategy went to going out West and, and trying to chip off the electoral votes of, of Western states like Utah and Idaho and Wyoming. And as I traveled those states with him, over and over I would meet conservatives who were concerned about this president. And of course he was not the president at the time, but from the time he launched his candidacy, there were people who did not feel he was a Republican. And he was coming in as a disruptor. Now let's not minimize how many millions of Americans did love that disruptive attitude that the president continues to take on the trail today. Uh, but it's very unusual now. And, and I would say this president himself was a former third party guy. He once tried to run for president as a reform party candidate and failed. Um, so third party politics and then, and particularly libertarian politics, which you find there are people that are uh, more about a cult of personality rather than really a strategy. Now it's the Republicans truly these days that have, have turned into uh, a party that's really about the man over the mission, I must say. But third parties have long been about people who fancy themselves to be change makers and don't really care about the strategy. So you see in states like Minnesota, where you do have a good independent streak, the party tends to get the most unusual people from the center. And those people don't really 
survive at the ballot box because they're taught, thought to be too unusual. They're people that are largely activists. This is what we've seen in modern history is the people mounting these bids are so unusual that they're unpalatable. Um, now, there's not much empirical data out there about that. But again, this is a year in which this is so unusual. 2020 is the year where people are solely being told, and, and to my recollection, of course, Professor Shapiro may know differently, that you should not vote third party because you are helping another candidate. And people really saw that in 2016. Uh, if I evoke the name Stein, people know who I'm talking about. There's a lot of blame going around to third party candidates that they, they help another person. And so John Adams, of course, uh, one of my favorite presidents, he would be aghast at our situation today. No doubt this is not where I had hoped our, our <laughs> republic would be, uh, though I do believe us to be a real democracy. We are a republic, many argue. And I, I believe that what we strive to do is strive for that more perfect union as the founders wanted. But in doing so, we've not acknowledged as a country that there are people that have been disenfranchised. There are groups that have been marginalized. And I, I recently sort of came up with this analogy. I uh, studied public health many years ago, and, uh, and I, I never put it in practice. However, I was on Capitol Hill at the time of the passage of the Affordable Care Act, working for Republican members. And for the audience, uh, you know that Republicans dubbed the Affordable Care Act as Obamacare. So, so I was there at that time, never really put my public health education in practice. But I'll say my favorite analogy right now, just because we live in the moment of a public health crisis, is, is that question you go to the doctor when you're looking to lose weight. And you say, doctor, what can I do to maintain a, a healthy weight or get to a healthy weight or have a healthy body? And the doctor says two things, diet and exercise. So if you come to an operative like me, I'll say to you, when you ask me, what do we need for a healthy democracy? And I will say access and participation. Those are the two key components to a healthy democracy. And when we don't have that, we have what's happening right now. We do not have the access for many populations out in rural Appalachia, where I grew up, for example, where they rely on the US Postal Service or in urban areas. There are groups that are, are being disenfranchised and again, marginalized uh, actively. And that, that's happening in real time. So I urge folks to, to find a way to look into that more because we tend to live in our own bubbles. But the founders really drafted our founding documents, hoping that all of us would take our parts very seriously. I believe it is the responsibility of all of us. It's in individual responsibility that is most important this election. It's incumbent upon all of us to go to the ballot box and, and express our voice, no matter what you may feel about the times. And you did mention the name Stein and the assumption that everyone would know, but just in <laughs> case, Dr. Jill Stein, uh, who did run uh, in 2016. Uh, and uh, there have been many third party candidates. John Anderson comes to mind, Ross Perot, of course. Uh, that's a panel for another day, the <laughs> insurgent third party candidate. Uh, let's uh, come around to you, Tricia Shimamura, and have you tell us about young people. Uh, traditionally, they don't vote uh, as much as democracy needs them to, but our reporting at WMYC, New York Public Radio, tells us that their registration numbers in, in the 18 to 24 demographic, that's how we've been slicing it, is way up this year. Uh, tell us what you're seeing on campus. Sure. So again, I'm, I'm so happy to be uh, included in this panel and thank you so much uh, to everyone else who's, who's here and participating today. Um, as the Director of Government Affairs um, at Columbia, a big part of my day to day right now has been focused on uh, GOTV and making sure that every student on campus um, and really every camp Columbia community member has Good information, the right information. They are uh, to know when they're register, when they need to register, how to register to vote, and then also how to make a plan and and how to actually follow through with that. And um, you're right, we are. Um, I am very hopeful um, this year to see high numbers uh, for 18 to 24 and even 24 plus um, voting. Um, Historically, we've seen at Columbia, at least, that there's a pretty good uh, voter registration rate, but maybe 
um, 20% or 15 to 20% drop off of those who actually vote. So um, while a lot of our focus has been on trying to get those students registered right now, you'll see us a little bit shift in making sure that everybody now, um, now that you're registered, you have a plan, you are already acting on that plan. And then even after that, um, you are mobilizing your friends and talking and touching and t uh, texting your friends and reaching out to them uh, to to vote. Um, it's been a it's been a mixed bag uh, to tell you the truth from from my uh, perspective. Um, we've heard from a lot of students who have said, "I've made my plan. I've got this. I'm, we're done. I'm, I've already voted." Uh, but we've also seen that the pandemic has really um, thrown a lot of students, a lot of first time voters, for a loop. Um, I've been hearing from students who have never mailed a letter before, and now they're trying to figure out how to mail uh, their mail their mail in ballot to a county clerk's office, and what is that, and um, and how do I know what county I'm in, and I'm not even in that county. I'm in New Jersey, sheltering in place with a friend. Um, so it's it's been difficult. Um, there are uh, Missouri, for instance, requires a notary to um, to sign off on your absentee ballot and to try to explain to an 18 year old um, how to first address an envelope, but then how to find a notary in the middle of a pandemic is um, is just impossible, really. And it's um, and so I I feel for the students. I talk talk to them all the time. Um, about the same things that uh, Robert and Rena and Midwin were all saying about um, the importance of voting. Uh, as someone who's worked for and worked with elected officials for my entire career, I tell them, and the only thing I'll add to this is that elected officials um, are going to work, are going to care, and are going to be responsive to those who vote. Um, it's it's just how it is. It's those who are actively saying that they want a seat at the table and they care about those issues. Those are the people who the elected officials and your government agencies and the bodies that are de deciding things are going to be responsive to. So even if you are, if you even if you think that your vote doesn't matter, even if you think that you're voting on things that don't affect you, the truth is, is that it, it all affects you. And when you actively choose not to vote, you are relinquishing your voice and your power to demand change. Um, so that is really the message that we're getting across to our students. It's it's just been, um, you know, it's, I've never seen before um, these kind of obstacles that students um, and first time voters in general have to face. Um, it's, you know, you're learning the voting process, but then you're also learning how to, how to fight for a, a right that you barely even had. Um, it's it's, um, it's kind of amazing. And I applaud those who are already, um, who have already done it or are in the process of doing so. Well, thank you for those answers about uh, the importance of voting and the right to vote. And we have a lot of excellent questions from the audience coming in already. Some came in advance of the panel, so I'm pretty much going to lean on those. Uh, but first, Bob, I'm going to uh, come back to you. I've been doing a lot of uh, panel conversations about voting and ha have recognized almost immediately how impossible it is to really cover all of the issues around voting in an hour. <laughs> uh, the challenges, the importance, obviously, but also uh, the, the hurdles that exist to voting, the challenges in this particular election season. Uh, but I'm going to ask you to do it in one, <laughs> one answer. Um, so, so each of you, when talking about voting, uh, of course, underscored uh, the critically important right that it is, but also each of you uh, addressed briefly, and now we're going to go back through some of them, the hurdles that exist, the challenges that are presented to the voter when he, she, they try to vote. Uh, Bob, can you give us sort of, to, to start us off, uh, an overview of uh, those barriers to participation? You know, you know, as Rena said, it's about access and participation. So what are the barriers to access and participation, uh, broadly speaking, uh, today in the year 2020 when there really should not be any? Well, well that's, that's, of course, an, an excellent question. Um, to, put it, to put it bluntly, uh, in the United States, we do not make it very easy for people to vote. And moreover, it's, it varies by state. 
That is, we, we don't have one nationalized election. We have separate elections in the states where the states have different rules. And it really is you know, rules and procedures, registration requirements, um, the day, well, simply the day of the week where we have, you know, we have elections, it's on a Tuesday, whereas other countries, for example, where they have much higher turnout, election day is a holiday or it's on the weekend. Um, also, the election is, it can be, it is extended over multiple days. Of course, now we do that by providing you know, early voting and so forth. But, but the, 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 the current biggest impediments have to do with uh, the consequences of, of the pandemic and also as a consequence of the uh, basically uh, ending the provisions of the Voting Rights Act where the states now can, 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 can if they wish, uh, constrain voting. Uh, and can constrain voting, you know, for basically whatever reason they, whatever reason they want, and we, and we you know, we, we we see that now in terms of what's happening in various states in terms of cutting back the number of polling places and and things and things and things and things of that sort, and and so it, re it really is it really is those those kinds of structural legal impediments that are put in place, which now have become very highly politicized, and we see you know we see it now the lines of voters in you know in Georgia and Texas that that pretty much sums it up right you know right there. Although one irony is, is that, that, that when you see the long lines, on the one hand, you may, you, you, we may be seeing uh, suppression. On the other hand, uh, a lot of people are out there for, you know, for reasons to fight suppression. And you know, so, I look at, so I looked at the lines, I, I thought two things. One, suppression, and then I thought mobilization. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna ask, I'm gonna come back to you uh, in a minute, Bob, about the pandemic uh, impact uh, and all of the questions about uh, the process in the midst of a pandemic. But let me jump over to you, Midwin, and have you pick up on the fallout from Shelby. Uh, and I'm seeing those lines as well. Uh, people actually bringing their folding chairs to uh, have a place to sit or maybe even sleep in line to vote. Uh, yeah is not the American way. Uh, it should not be the American way. I mean, certainly that commitment to vote is the American way, but having to wait in line with a chair should not be. Uh, so say, say a bit, Midwin, about what that uh, symbolizes to you uh, in terms of voter suppression or voter mobilization, or perhaps the intersection of the two. I'm seeing it in Georgia. Of course, it's also in Texas. Uh, tell us what you see when you uh, turn on your television and see those lines. Yeah, well, I see a, I see a bit of both. I see uh, a bit of voter suppression. Uh, it, I also see a bit of um, high participation and energy. But thirdly, I also see the fact that we're in a pandemic. So it could be that a lot of these long lines are the result of social distancing, right? Um, perhaps some of these polling places can't allow in so many people at the same time. So my hope is that this is a mixture of all of those three things. But we do know without a doubt uh, that since the Shelby decision that several states have literally overnight passed a number of laws to make it more difficult for people to vote. Um, not just closing polling stations, uh, but requiring voter ID. Um, uh, requiring uh, uh, voter cutting off the number, the, the days in which you could register to vote. And most people would say, well, what's the big deal with having a voter ID? But you have to remember that not all of America is like New York City, like not all of America is urban. A lot of people, uh, like Rena said, live in Appalachia, they live in rural areas, they don't have cars if they're poor. And so the idea of having to get a government ID is a hurdle. So what isn't a hurdle for us who live in urban areas and can just hop on a train or a bus and go get a, a government issue ID is not the same for people who live in different kinds of counties. So anytime you put up a barrier, you prevent someone, you make it more difficult for someone to vote. And when you make it for difficult for someone to vote, that person is perhaps less likely to go vote. So you have voter ID, you have closing polling stations, you have limiting the time that people can vote, limiting the time that, that people can register to vote. And, and like Tricia said, 
you also have the requirement in some states of uh, when people want to mail in their ballots, they have to have a witness. You also have signature matching. And what, what you see is when people mail in ballots, for example, in some states you can mail in ballots, and that's become a lot more prevalent now because of, of the pandemic, you also see a high number of rejection of mail-in ballots. And again, statistically, the, when you look at the groups of people whose mail-in ballots are being rejected, statistically, it's higher amongst people with names that are not anglicized. So not just for Black people, but also Latino, Indian, uh, people with, with Arab sounding names. Those mail-in ballots tend to be rejected more. Uh, throughout the country, we have seen not just um, Republicans uh, challenge or, or pass these sort of voter suppression laws, that's, that's just what they are, but you also see it happening with the Trump campaign. So the actual campaign is also filing lawsuits against states to curb the uh, access in the way people vote. So none of this is being done to expand the right to vote. What it's doing is constricting the right to vote. And we say we're a democracy, right? We say, you know, the voice of the people matter, but yet what we look like right now is, is falling far short of that. And we should point out that in the Shelby case, though Southern uh, counties were implicated, there were some Northern counties that also uh, were under that pre-clearance requirement right. uh, before changing their voting rules. And now uh, no longer are. So it's not always just the South. It's not always Georgia, Mississippi, the Carolinas. It's sometimes uh, New York was one of those pre-clearance states, one of the counties in New York. So we, we, we shouldn't uh, be, be so quick to assume that we are without sin in our region where we live. Uh, Rena, I want to talk to you about another case. Uh, what is ballot harvesting? Uh, and why is Trump so against it? And why is the US Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court's coming up a lot in this conversation. Uh, why are they considering that issue uh, right now? You know, my theory on why the president harps about certain things, um, one over the other on one particular day and why his administration is pursuing action against certain actions like ballot harvesting, um, which is, you know, is that he's trying anything. He'll try anything to see what sticks. Um, this is a moment in time, and I really wanna get to, to the crux of, I think, what it, it really matters here. And what matters is the Republicans are really scared right now. And again, I've made my entire career in this party, uh, but I'm not supportive of this president. However, I remain in the party in hopes that we will rebuild. Um, if the president loses this fall, uh, what I think is gonna have to happen is a real reckoning uh, about what this party has done over the years. And I think we can't really know where we're going until we know where we've been. And I became a Republican because I, I'm really pragmatic. I mean, more than anything else. I really, in my family's history, I saw how government can get too big, too oppressive and drive us out of a country. My family on my father's side was driven out of Uganda. We lost everything due to a dictator. So, so really that's at, that's at the core of what I believe. And what today's Republican party is doing by, by really calling out the other side for campaign tactics and, and electoral tactics that include ballot harvesting. Um, and now there's a lot of talk about naked ballots. Um, they, they don't realize how rich it is. This is the same Republican Party that just within the past 10 years has seen a number of cases blow up in states like North Carolina, where GOP operatives were found to be taking ballots and discarding them. And so when the president talks about ballots showing up in creeks, um, frankly, it's false. Uh, there's been no evidence of that. But I will say again, to talk about the origins of the Republican Party, you've got to know uh, the Republican Party historically fought to expand equal rights, including at the ballot box. And in the aftermath of the Civil War, what Republicans sponsored and passed were three constitutional amendments during Reconstruction. And that was the 13th Amendment, which prohibited slavery, the 14th Amendment, which barred states from denying um, <clears throat> equal protection of the laws, excuse me, and the 15th Amendment, which dictated that the right to vote couldn't be denied on the basis of race. Fast forward to a half century later, 
Republicans were then critical to passing the 19th Amendment, which is we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of it being ratified, the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. Now, not all women, white women, uh, but the 19th Amendment prohibited disenfranchise based on sex. These were Republicans, again, a half century later only, were critical to that passing. So, so today's Republican Party is engaging in all kinds of suppression efforts because they realize what they have not done a good job of and this is me being critical of a party that I intend to hope uh, hope and intend to lead in the future because I've made my entire career in this party. I believe we need healthy two parties right now. Um, and I don't see a healthy party in the Republicans right now for this very reason is that they're engaging in tactics that are simply uh, below the belt when they accuse the Democrats of doing the same thing. And so then would you agree, Rena, that the term ballot harvesting is a bit loaded and that uh, the Trump forces and and other conservative activists use that loaded term it really should be something like ballot collection yes yes and they like that language because it is so loaded so can and, you explain uh, can you explain what it is so that our uh our audience understands how the absentee <clears throat> ballot is filled out and then uh it's collected and delivered well, it varies state to state. There are some states, like for example, right now, it's really, and, and perhaps Midwin could, could get into this on with me, because I, I really believe that there's a lot of misinformation about what can happen in certain states. Where is it allowed? It is allowed in certain states. And ballot har harvesting involves a law that allows third parties to collect and deliver ballots in, in some states. So we have to be really clear about that. People don't realize what's on the books in terms of law in their states. Um, right now, because of the pandemic, we know that in nursing homes, for example, certain actions like this are happening. And so um, it's, it's really controversial. And I just encourage people to know the laws of where they live, because this is exactly what the Republicans want right now. They want the chaos and misinformation to sow doubt in the minds of people who are voting in good faith um, so that when the election result comes to whether it's the night of November 3rd or some days after, or some weeks after, you know, in January, uh, which is what the Trump administration wants. They want the courts to decide this. People ought to know what was permissible in their state in terms of being able to um, send your ballot through or what it needed. Did it need your signature, for example? Here in Virginia, some people need to sign their ba absentee ballot, some don't. Right. Mine clearly has a sticker that you do not need to sign. So again, a lot of misinformation, but perhaps one of the other panels can back me up on this. There, yeah. uh, sorry. Go ahead, Edwin. That, that, okay. that is correct. It does vary from state <clears throat> to state. It's basically a kindness measure. Nursing homes, people who uh, need to have their ballots co collected. California has uh, allows for this. But go ahead, Midwin, if you want to clarify. Yeah, I, I just was going to say, so that essentially is what ballot harvesting is. It is taking the ballot of someone else that isn't yours and bringing it to the ballot box or to your county official. Now, you can imagine it's not allowed in some states, but, but you realize that by not allowing that, you reduce the number of people who can't get to the ballot box, whether it be because they are differently abled or elderly. And remember, I talked before about people who live in rural counties, who are poor, don't have access to a car, the nearest county official or polling station is miles away. So ballot harvesting, if you can imagine, if you're allowed to do it, you expand access to voting. But if you're not allowed to do it, you constrict. The argument for not allowing it to do it, which is why some states have this law on the books, is that it opens the door for fraud. It opens the door for people to uh, pretend that they are taking the vote for someone else when in fact it is their vote. But we know statistically that vote of fraud, at least from in that method, just doesn't happen. I mean, I mean, voter fraud, as we've been talking about it for the since, uh, at least as Donald Trump presents it, is not a big problem in this country. It doesn't happen statistically. We're 330 million people in this country and voting fraud rarely happens. There are states that have been voting by mail exclusively for years. Our service men and women who live abroad have been voting by mail for years. So this idea that all of a sudden in 2020, voting by mail is going to be a catastrophe and that people are going to commit fraud is just not credible. Yeah, Oregon has been voting 
by mail for years. And for they, years. Yeah, have not had problems. Uh, let me come to you, Tricia, uh, to, to round out this conversation about the impediments to voting. I mean, there are so many that we've not talked about, but I think we are giving the audience a sense of the ways in which uh, I guess citizens need to engage with the process and as part of their civic duty, really understand the rules of their state, the rules of their uh, county, their jurisdiction, uh, their absentee balloting, if, if that's what they choose to do. Uh, what, what specifically, you started to mention this, uh, Tricia, in your first answer, but what are some of the young people uh, that you encounter uh, describing as they try to participate, I would assume mostly absentee on your campus. Right, so I just, I think that I, just to add something to what Rena and Midwin had said. So one, another piece to this that, that we're really seeing is that as, as everybody had said, it's very, very state by state. And so when we, um, when we have been reaching out and, and doing this outreach uh, to, to our students, um, it's really had to be very, very specific. And, and we've been trying to not just tell them, you know, you should register to vote and here's your deadline, but we've been trying to do a little bit of the teach a man to fish sort of thing and trying to better connect them and, and teach them about who, who makes the decisions about elections in your state. Do you have a state a secretary, a, a, a secretary of state office that oversees it? Is there a board of elections? Is there a county clerk's office? Is there a division of elections underneath your governor's office. There, this is really uh, that piece to it. And so, um, to what, re and just to add on to what Rena and Midwin were saying about suppression tactics and and ways in which we're, uh, uh, you see people trying to reduce the number of voices at the table. Another piece of this is, I've I've seen this. Um, it is the information is just not clear at all. Um, if you're a Columbia student uh, living in the United States, then you should at this point have received an email from Suzanne Goldberg and Shayla Murray um, with my email attached to it, telling you your specific, trying to connect you with your very, very specific in voter information. You should have received an, a, a, about voter deadlines, about whether or not your state differentiates between absentee and mail-in ballots, about where you need to go to, to register, about deadlines for registration of those, whether or not COVID is, is a valid excuse in your state, um, but in, in kind of putting together those targeted emails that we uh, sent out to all of our students, um, it was my, me and my team who, who went through state by state to find this information. And you know, long story short, it's not clear um, at all. Sometimes we, we would spend 30 minutes to an hour on a, on a singular state because we couldn't, just could not find out what your actual deadline was to submit an absentee ballot or whether or not it needed to be postmarked by November 2nd or postmarked by November 3rd or when the actual deadline is. And I would say that the, the um, lack of clarity and the, uh, is, is a form of voter suppression as well. Um, people are not empowered when they are not educated. Um, it, 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 you know, the empower, I, I should say, empowerment comes with education. Um, and, uh, and truly having now just seen all 50 states plus Washington, D.C. and going through, um, you know, 51 different websites and 51 different um, sets of, of rules, um, there are no, as Robert said, there, there is not one state is similar to another. You would think maybe California and, Nevada and, um, and L.A. or, I'm sorry, California and New York or something like that. No states are similar at all in this. And no state is um, uniform in how they relay this information out. Um, arguably, even New York could be better and clearer in, in, this, in this way. Um, so just to add on to that, and for our student, and for the students, I, again, they, uh, we're trying to tell them not just to vote, but, but as a member of the Columbia community, you are a voter. You are a constant voter. You're gonna vote this year, you're gonna vote next year, you're gonna vote the year after that. Um, and, but to try to connect them with these resources, it's very difficult because a lot of these states, um, it's, just not, it's just not clear um, at all. And that I would say is just another form of suppression that we're seeing, just this lack of uh, clarity. So Bob, coming over to you, uh, there are a number of things that I'm hearing, uh, but our fundamental form of federalism uh, seems to be a problem. Uh, in so many things, but, but 
in terms of our voting. And maybe it, at the inception, it was less so because we didn't have uh, so much shared information cr across the nation. So, you know, if there was uh, one system in one place and a different system in a different place, it, it didn't matter all that much. There wouldn't be that much confusion. You walk down to the town hall, you said, hey, Marge, along the way, <laughs> Stop for a cup of coffee and then you voted and you went back to the farm. But now uh, you're hearing about what's happening in Georgia, even if you live in New York. You're hearing about the California situation, even if you live in Nevada. And it, it feeds the notion of confusion and disarray. Uh, and then, of course, we have the COVID, uh, added concentration of COVID. Uh, can you say a bit more about? Uh, the the um, sort of the complexion of the nation around voting uh, and whether it's just a systemic problem of federalism that really cannot be fixed. That is just how we roll in this country, right? Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Well, at, at the founding, it was actually a little bit simpler. That is, we had there was a federal system then. The Constitution was silent with regard to who the who eligible voters were. And that was determined by the states anyway. But more, moreover, back then, um, the electors weren't, weren't elected by the people you know, directly. The, in fact, the only elected office where, where in the Constitution where voters picked the representative was in the House of Representatives. The, uh, the, the electors, the state legislatures, according to the Constitution, were allowed to decide how the electors were picked. Of course, it evolved over time. It became more democratic and we voted directly for, you know, for electors. But then, but, but then it became a free-for-all in in as, as the electorate expanded, how the states were, were going to permit people to vote and, 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 and establish the process by which people you know, uh, register and, and so forth. And we, we, we have this just chaotic 50 state system, we, you know, with different sets of rules. And as Tricia pointed out, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's chaotic. Um, fast forward to the present where, where, we, where, where the rubber really hits the road. And, uh, and, we, and we talked about this you know, earl, earlier in the week in, in talking about this, this session. It's, a, it's affecting the timing of the counting of the ballots. Now, it's become more complicated with, 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 with the mail ballots. And everybody now, you, 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 well, the, there are the accusations of possible fraud and court cases and, th and things like that. But the big issue is, is how quickly the votes are going to be counted. And there, add the chaos. Each state has different rules with regard to the processing of the votes. In some states, uh, some, some states process the votes upon the, the, the absentee ballots upon receipt. Uh, there's early voting that's, that's tabulated. Uh, some, some states do it at a certain point before election day, and that matters. And others only begin on election day itself. And the, the big question is, is how quickly are we going to be able to find out the results? And the answer, of course, well, it depends on what's going on in each of the states. Now, it, it, tur it turns out, despite warnings of, of everyone needing to be patient, it turns out, you know, given what, even given what the rules are, we're going to have a good idea on election day night and the, and the day after what's going on. First of all, they're the, the non-controversial the, the non part of the election is there are a lot of states that are overwhelmingly Democratic and overwhelmingly Republican. Uh, if, if a network calls the, that makes a call in Alabama that Trump wins, nobody's going to get upset about that. Or in New York that, that Biden, Biden wins. But it's, it, but it's in the 12 swing states where, where, where things matter. But even there, there's some states like Arizona that pre-process process ballots upon receipt and Florida where they have, where they, where they do it, uh, and they can do it as early as, you know, as early in, in, as, as in early October, uh, and, and also their ballot deadline is November 3rd, where we may have a good idea about what's going on in Arizona, Florida, Georgia, uh, New Hampshire, because of, 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 the, of the rules there. And, you know, if in those states, for example, if, we, if you know, if Biden were to win Florida and Arizona, that's going to that's going to say a lot about the outcome of the election, even before the rest of the states votes are counted. But the but the but big takeaway here is because of the federal system, it's going to affect how we get information about the final results of the election. Uh, Midwin, we heard uh, Bob there say uh, twelve key states. Sometimes we hear eight key states, but we have a question here from the audience: How can New Yorkers, or for that matter, anyone? in a safe blue state, that's quote, safe blue state, but I guess red staters might ask the same question, 
how do people who are in states that are not in play keep motivated and engaged around an election year? I, I, yeah, I get this a lot. And, and I've thought about this myself as well, uh, because I live in a state where I almost never get to cast a vote in, in, uh, for the person that I want in a primary, because by the time New York does their primary, the candidate is already chosen. So um, uh, one of the things that I always tell people when they ask, when they ask that question is the popular vote. The popular vote really matters. As you know, Hillary Clinton uh, won the popular vote against Donald Trump by over 3 million votes. And that matters, because when we want to talk about um, representation, full representation, the numbers matter as you start to add them up. And we talk about a lot about representation. One of the things that we're seeing is we have a Senate, for example, that has uh, that represents two senators that represent states, but we have two senators to represent millions of people that live in California, but two senators to represent just a few hundred thousand people that live in North Dakota or Wyoming. So what the popular vote does is tell us what the majority of the people want. Even though we have an electoral college in picking a president, the popular vote is just as important. So I always say, cast your vote anyway, whether you live in a blue state and you don't think it matters, it actually does. Because we it's always good to make that argument that Hillary won the popular vote, Obama won the popular vote. A lot of Democrats win the popular vote. I mean, a Republican president has not won the popular vote in a long time. And it's important to, to know those numbers and to know those statistics when you're trying to make arguments about representation, what does it mean, and what does the majority of the country want? Because I think when you start thinking about that, the majority of the country leans a particular way, but yet we are represented by people that lean another way. People tend to refer to that as minority rule. And so it's important, I think, for you to speak up and to cast your vote so that it can be abundantly clear what the majority of Americans want, even if it's not reflected in the end result. And it's also true, Rena, that we vote not just for our president or even our congressional representatives, or even in terms of the US Supreme Court, which is on everyone's mind this year, but we vote about very important local and state issues, right? And we should be engaged around those issues because uh, as was said earlier, uh, things in our everyday lives are impacted by the way we vote. Yeah, you know, local elections genuinely matter. And, and people often ask me that as I've traveled around the country for many years as a political operative. Well, how much does it really matter who I'm voting for in, in for Board of Supervisors, for example, here in Virginia, in my county, we have we have that. Uh, we have a representative that we send over to the board, to a Board of uh, Supervisors, excuse me. So the reality is, is the, these boards, these municipal councils, your local people, have such a great impact on your daily life. And if you're not choosing those people, then you're really not, um, you're really not exercising the agency that you have. And you're not really enshrining the value, your values into the world around you. Because your values, when they're hyper-local, that's that daily impact on your life. So yes, uh, you know, these federal elections no doubt matter. Um, I think the, the best thing I've seen about people saying local elections matters to, to bring up the, you know, these characters that you see on shows like Parks and Recreation. You have some very uh, over the top, overzealous people like the character Leslie Nope, who's one of my favorite characters, that tells you how hard people in local government are working for you to have such great things in this country, such as clean water. You know, that's a, a basic thing that we take for granted often. And, and it came to our consciousness when, for example, in Flint, 
you know, Flint, Michigan, that we, we learned that our fellow cit American citizens were not getting their cl uh, clean water. So when you're talking about local politics, it's important to pay attention. It's important to talk to your friends about what's happening at the local level. If you're really frustrated by the fact that, for example, in, in my neighboring Washington, D.C., where I lived for over a decade and, and paid taxes, um, and then for my New York folks, I'll say that my, ta my license plate said taxation without representation because we didn't have a member in Congress who had a vote. Um, we had a figurehead a delegate. Uh, but living, you know, next door DC, I, I was a Republican there for the longest time. We did not have a single Republican on the city council. And so I, I every couple years would get with the local party and say, what, who are we going to run? Who are we going to try to get up there? Even in the minority seat on the council that was occupied by a Democrat. So if you're frustrated when you see things like that happening at the local level, convey that frustration into something else. I mean, I think voting is a civic duty, no doubt. Um, of course, it's not mandatory in this country, but when I think of civic duty, I think of stepping outside the ballot box. And I think about more than that I voted sticker and posting it on social media. I think that our civic duty is more of a set of responsibilities. And that includes protesting, volunteering, and running for office. I often get uh, from women, a lot of women are in my demographic, I'm a millennial, uh, women between the ages of 25 and 39, well, I gotta finish my degree, or I've got young children, or I just don't have time, or look, that's just not something I'm into. Politics is not something I'm into. And I say, well, politics is about your life and it's about my life. It's not something that we just choose to be into. I'm not into football, so I don't watch football, but I am into soccer. Politics isn't that kind of choice. It, everything that happens in government impacts us. And so if you're not having your say at the local level, you are, you're really um, doing such a disservice to your fellow citizens and you're not using everything that's in your toolbox um, that can give you access uh, to having your voice heard. And, and, and it's a privilege and a duty in this country. So I implore everybody to think about voting very differently in this era. Um, people always say this is the most consequential election of our time. But like I mentioned earlier, I have a public health degree. I have my master's in public health. And I think every day about when this, epi uh, this pandemic, excuse me, will stop having the impact it's having on the American family and what we're going to do when we come out of it. And I want to elect leaders that make plans. And so this really is the most consequential election that we've seen in my lifetime because lives are on the line and too many of my fellow Americans have perished from this. And I just feel that at every level, we have to hold our leaders accountable over and over. And it has to be after November 3rd as well. So it's incumbent upon all of us, all of you listening to go and get yourself involved in some new initiatives. There, there's great data out there that tells you, you ought to. There's I Am A Voter, which I love. One of my favorite groups, IamAVoter.com, they, they gave me some startling statistics about my fellow millennials that we make up 40% of non-voters. That's incredible to me. And, and then there's Renew Democracy Initiative, another group I love um, with the very famous chess player, Gary Kasparov, who's, who's at the helm of that group. And then there's Represent Us, which also has some really great uh, information about how you can change the system as well. And I'm talking about systemic change, electoral reform. This is all stuff we should care about. And those are just three, three groups that I think are doing great work. And I hope you'll look into them. Well, you anticipated a question from the audience about organizations we can become involved with to help uh, the electorate become more civically engaged. So thanks for that, Rena. Uh, but you did also use the phrase that I've heard so often, the most consequential election of my lifetime or of our lives, or sometimes people will say of modern times, I've even heard the most consequential election in American history. So Bob, I wanna come back to you uh, about something you said to the first question when you said uh, that voting this time around uh, is critical for our democracy. Uh, and I almost interrupted to ask you, is that hyperbolic? Uh, uh, say more about that. Why you feel that our democracy is actually on the line here? Well, it, 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 it's, it, it's, on, it, it's been put on the line here by some of the, some of the statements uh, of our president and, and some actions that, 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 are, that are being taken. That it's claims of, of vote fraud definitely occurring even before an election's occurred. Ordering the Justice Department prior to the casting, prior to election day, investigating vote fraud. It's raising questions of 
you know, you know whether we can have free, you know, free and fair elections. It's it's accusing, you know, American voters and, and citizens engaging in you know in, in fraudulent behavior when when in fact the government itself may be acting in, in, a, in an inappropriate authoritarian way. I mean, we, we, there's you know, I mean, you know, Jimmy Carter and his organization that that sends observers to elections around the world. I believe. I don't know if it's, it's going to, he's going to follow up on it or it's going to happen, but we're, they're talking about sending observers to observe American elections and whether or not any international institution will, will do the same. This kind, of, this kind of thing is unheard of in the, in the United States. And, it's, you know, and it's basically, it's very insulting and demeaning to the United States as well. And so just being able to conduct a free and fair election, also in the context of foreign interference in elections, who would have thought we'd be, we, we, we would be talking about that kind of thing? Misinformation, uh, debates about facts and lies. These, these kinds of things are just normatively incredible. And uh, you know, it, may, it may sound hyperbolic, but, it, but, it, but it's actually real given what's happened in, in what's happening now and what happened in the, uh, uh, in the last election. We impeached the president of the United States for reasons related to this. Something that seems like a blip <laughs> that happened so long ago, and yet it was within just the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I want to follow up with you, though, Bob, on the on the impeachment, but more specifically, and perhaps more significantly, on what was at the core of that inquiry, the Russian interference, and what was in the Mueller report, and what continues to be reported, uh, and that's ongoing interference by uh, Russia and others, uh, how at jeopardy, uh, how much in jeopardy, uh, to correct my grammar, uh, is the 2020 election uh, from, from foreign interference? Well, I, th I think, I think the, the, well, we know from the Mueller report and also from our U.S. intelligence agencies, uh, led by people appointed by Donald Trump, that the, the, threat, the threat is real. There, there, have been, there, have been a, you know, there have been attempts that are made. Uh, there is a question of what, what effect those kinds of things that actually had on American elections. And I have an odd, I have a, I have a renegade view on this. I think the, the actual- Let's hear, Let's hear your renegade view. The renegade view is that what, what, what the foreign governments are, have done and are doing are inc obviously incredibly wrong and despicable. In terms of their net effect on voters, I, I don't, just for reasons having to do with political psychology, I don't think the, the influences are that great. I think in the 2016 election, the, the, the late Comey revelations about Hillary Clinton's email, that kind of thing mattered, you know, mattered, mattered more. But the, that far, foreign governments are doing that is, is, is really, just the idea of them doing it is, is despicable. Then the, but the one other thing is, is that there is the question uh, of whether or not the, there can be foreign interference in the um, electioneering pro in, in the voting process itself that is hacking into voting systems. Yeah. The one yeah. virtue, the one virtue of the one virtue of our chaotic 50 state system is that they're separate systems and, and, to, and, and, and for, for that kind of interference to occur, it's going to have to occur state by state, which makes, which makes that very difficult. We don't have a unified system, so there can't be a single hacking effort that, it, that jeopardizes the entire nation. So, so the question that we have here from one of our uh, audience members about hacking into voting machines, uh, your answer would go to that? Yes, it, 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 would, it would go to that. I mean, the, the bigger question, it's not, it, it's the machines, but it's also any electronic tabulation of the votes in, a, in some kind of centralized place within a state. But again, the, 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 those interfering would have to approach this state by state. Now, of mm -hmm. course, they wouldn't have to go into every state. It's the key, it's the key states that matter. But we haven't we, we haven't seen anything like that yet. Correct. Uh, so, Tricia, let me come to you about uh, when we talk about Russian interference, and especially when you read the Mueller report, uh, which I found fascinating. It read like a, a spy novel, but a much more frightening uh, read because it was real and it was our country. Um, it, it's so much about the psychology of Americans and especially social media users. So I wonder what young people are saying, uh, and even not just young people, people on a campus community uh, say and think about Facebook and Twitter and social media at the intersection of this election cycle. Uh, if, if, if you can even characterize it in a few sentences. Are people suspicious? Are they aware? Um, do, do, they, do, they, do, do, do they recognize that Facebook and Twitter are pulling back quite a bit 
uh, not enough in my view, but quite a bit from where they were in 2016 uh, on, on uh, what can be posted and what can be pulled down. Uh, even yesterday, they pulled down uh, something that the New York Post had reported around the election. Uh, what's being said on campus? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, certainly it's, it's a fascinating time. And it's, as, ad as administrators, we, um, it's, it's a really interesting time to, to find, to, to figure out how to engage with our students and, and what, uh, through which, what means that they are receiving information and that they're going to be most uh, likely to, to engage back. Um, we found that obviously students are, are extremely, um, receptive to, to social media and to these different sites and, and, and get their information a lot from things like Twitter and, um, and Facebook and, and Instagram and things like that. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting, you know, and even I would say even, even not students, even uh, departments, it's been fascinating. We've, you know, had to run interference with departments to make sure that they're sharing correct information from reliable sources and from reliable, uh, you know, um, voting resources and that sort of thing that aren't swayed one way or the other. Um, so it's, it's a kind of an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing kind of conversation and, and struggle that we've been having. I think that students are very aware. I think that it doesn't take much for us for a first time for a, for a young 18 to 24 year old to feel like uh, your vote doesn't matter and any information out there is is wrong and any elected official is corrupt and it doesn't really matter to me and you don't represent me you don't know anything about me the decisions you make are not going to be anything that are not going to impact me in any way so i i think that there's it, it's very easy for somebody to feel that way particularly now i had a lot of students um after in 2016 tell me that uh, my candidate didn't win. And so what does it matter? I, it was my first time I voted and she didn't win or, the, you know, and, and so it doesn't matter to me. Why, why would I do this again? Um, I think to just go back to what Rena was saying, I think that my personal opinion on how to combat that is, um, is to connect students more directly with um, with their electeds and with this, you know, it, to make it personal. And I think that the easiest way to do that is through local government. Um, we had something that we've worked with a lot and something that's a personal passion of mine um, to better connect individual people with those who represent them. Because when you actually realize that your concerns matter, be it about uh, our universal health care system or, or uh, that, you know, pothole on my corner that needs to get fixed it once you once you better connect and make that kind of relationship there just more direct then I think that you then you actually have a more engaged citizen so I, I cannot agree with you more in terms of uh, connecting people with the local um, it's why things like and I see Suzanne's on here but it's why things like see you engage is so important it's why um, voting in every election is very important no matter if it's federal, state, or, or local, because I think that once once students in general see and have a better, a more intimate relationship with the agencies and government and decision makers around them, then then they become more involved and, and realize that they have a, a, that they have a say and have a perspective on it that, that matters. Um, I will just make a plug um, that vote.columbia.edu is a new site that we have um, that really has all of these different resources on it to help students uh, figure out their plan for voting. Um, our office is also very interested in always connecting students with, uh, with the local community board, with, their, with uh, local, their council members over here, the borough president's office over here, and others um, to help them be more involved in their local communities. And we're always here to, to help them, even if it's not here right now, if it's, you know, if, if you're in Missouri or Nevada or anywhere else, we're um, absolutely willing to help make those connections for you. Jamie, can I just make one quick point on that? Uh, you have time? Is it, yes, I see it. Okay. You go right ahead. Okay. Just one quick point I wanted to ju just buttress what Trisha and Rena said about local elections. Every time a young person tells me that, that they don't want to vote, it's not just the presidency, it's local elections. It's the Senate. Look at the confirmation hearings. Who's in that room? Senators. But also, most importantly, just look at how the, the pandemic was handled. Who your mayor and who your governor is made a huge difference on how the pandemic was assessed, the threat level, as well as the plan to get your state 
in order. So every time someone, so nothing is going to explain to us how important local elections are than how this pandemic was handled. Excellent point, Midwin. I, I have so many more questions for all of you, but I think it will have to wait until our next meeting, perhaps after the election. Suzanne is back. Suzanne, yes. take it away. Wow, what an incredible conversation. And I also just wish we could go on for the rest of the afternoon and, and, and continue to hear from, from all of you. It's really, really, really wonderful. And it is very much what we're about, sort of bringing our university community and many others together to talk about the most pressing issues of our time. And unquestionably what everybody here has been talking about today is exactly that. Um, I want to underscore what Tricia said, vote.columbia.edu is a tremendous resource for people in and outside of the university, actually. I also, um, picking up on what Tricia said, want to encourage everybody who hasn't already filled out their census form. As you may have seen in the news, this is a big issue and you got to do it now. So time, if you haven't opened up that envelope, time to do it, figure it out. It doesn't take that long. Uh, I want to thank Jamie for being a fantastic moderator and thoughtful interlocutor always, and thank each of our panelists for really wonderful conversation. I want to encourage everybody who is with us to follow University Life on social media so that you can keep up with events like this, uh, share this video when it, as soon as it's up, and really uh, please everybody join me in thanking our panelists here for just a, a really wonderful and thought-provoking conversation. We'll continue the conversation soon. And in the meantime, see you soon. <laughs>